All right, it is 10 o'clock. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Carl Hanson. I am an infectious disease physician and a member of the PSMID. I'd like to welcome you to this morning's activity. It's another collaborative event between the Philippine College of Physicians and the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. And we have entitled this COVID-19 and Vaccines addressing myths, misconceptions, and fears. And so we have two very distinguished speakers today. Um, I'd like to introduce them to you um, at the same time na, para uh, na tayo later on. No? Our first, ano tayo? Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. I am I'm practicing in the NCR. Our first speaker is Dr. Faith Villanueva, and she hails from Cebu. She's another uh, infectious disease physician um, practicing at Chonghua Hospital in Cebu and Mandawe City. And you see her affiliations and memberships there on the screen. But she's also a very active member of my uh, committee in the PSMID, the uh, media uh, IT and Media Relations or Social Media Committee. You know? So we'll hear from her talk about some of the myths that you um, might be, might, you know, it might be in your head, so we'll, we'll, we'll help address them no, to allay the fears. The second uh, speaker is Dr. Catherine Roa. Uh, she is also an infectious disease specialist from Davao. No? She uh, practices at the Southern Philippines Medical Center as well as several private clinics. She is uh, also part of several national panels. Most, uh, most recently, no, she is the PSMID's representative to NAFIC. And she's also the site principal investigator for the SPMC arm of the WHO Solidarity Trial. So without further ado, we need all the time that we have because we need uh, a lot of time also for q and I'd like to call on Dr. Faith Villanueva for her talk. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, as Carl said, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. On behalf of the Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Diseases and the Committee on Adult Immunization, I would like to thank everyone for this opportunity to talk about COVID-19 vaccines. And uh, hopefully by the end of the session, uh, we will be able to give you all the needed information you need to convince you to get yourself vaccinated to help us to help in the in the control of the pandemic. So I have nothing to disclose as far as the vaccines are concerned, but I would like to disclose that I am a strong advocate for vaccination, not just for COVID-19, but for all vaccine preventable um, diseases. So this is going to be my topic outline. I will give you the current status of the pandemic and then the important role of vaccines in controlling the pandemic, and then generalities of the COVID-19 vaccines, the mechanism of action, the regulatory process that it has to go through, the EUA, which is uh, basically in the news right now, and then some of the important safety precautions that we have to bear in mind when we do start to get the vaccines, when we, are, we will get the vaccines already. So let me start with the current status. So. This is where we are more than a year after. It, just to remind everyone, COVID-19 was first reported in an outbreak of respiratory infections in Wuhan, China in December 2019. And then on January 30, 2020, the World Health Organization declared it as a public health emergency of international concern. It was called NCOV by then. And then on the same day, January 30, 2020, here in the Philippines, the Department of Health reported the first confirmed case of COVID-19 in the country. On February 1, 2020, the Department of Health reported the first death in the country due to COVID-19. So if you remember, they were tourists um, who originated from Wuhan, 
and who traveled to the Philippines for a vacation. On March 7, 2020, the Department of Health reported the first case of community transmission in the country. This was a 60-year-old plus man who had no history of travel to a, to a country where COVID was reported then, but who presented with symptoms, who tested positive, and was eventually admitted in a hospital in Manila. And then on March 11, 2020, the WHO declared COVID-19 as a pandemic. And on the right side of this right side of this slide, you will see the current status as far as the numbers are concerned. So this is as of yesterday, February 22, 2021. Globally, the total number of confirmed cases is now at 110 million plus, with about 2.5 million deaths and a mortality rate of 2.2 percent. Here in the country, as of yesterday, we have a total of 563,456 confirmed cases and around more than 12,000 12, deaths and um, um, mortality rate of 2.2%. And as of yesterday, uh, there were 28,488 active cases in the entire country. And you can see in the bottom box, the breakdown of these active cases, majority 88.1% are mild cases, and there are, there's about 5.7 asymptomatics. We have um, 2.6 severe cases and then 2.7 critical cases. So um, it is thus um, a little consoling that most of the cases we are seeing right now are uh, mild to moderate, but mild. But um, this is not to downplay the, the the current situation. We are still in a pandemic. We still do not must not um, relax the what we are doing right now in terms of preventing the transmission. Now, the current status have the following concerns. The first one is the post-holiday increase in cases that we are seeing. And you can see this on this um, slide. I, I'm not so sure if in your slide that the dates are very clear, but um, this was the, the, the surge we experienced in middle of last year, um, end of first quarter up to middle of last year. And then with all the minimum public health standards, uh, the, the lockdowns, and the other preventive measures that we put in place, we were able to put down the numbers actually, but we saw an increase in the numbers again after the Christmas holidays. Um, this is actually a concern because even though we are saying that the cases, more, most of the cases are mild, um, if these numbers continue to rise and they, then they will infect our vulnerable population, we might need to expect more increased morbidity and mortality among this um, vulnerable population. The second concern that we have to deal with is the SARS-CoV-2 variants. So as of yesterday, our Department of Health reported 62 confirmed um, B11, B117 variants. This is our data from the Philippine Genome Center. And then as of yesterday, there have, there's a total of 34 variants um, exhibiting the N501Y and the E484K mutations. Now, I would like to state that the, the, the emergence of these variants is not something that caught us by surprise. We know that viruses have the ability to mutate so that throughout the pandemic, this virus has been mutating at a rate of about one to two mutations per month. But... Uh, for some variants, they have accumulated significant mutations in such short periods of time so that they are able to um, infect a lot of people. Now, we have to know that the continued uncontrolled transmission and other elective pressures are creating ideal conditions for additional significant virus evolution or viral mutation. So the important message here is if we are able to pre prevent transmission, we are also able to prevent the, the, the emergence of these variants. Now, these SARS-CoV-2 variants have the following real or potential consequences. They may have or they have the ability to spread more quickly. They have the ability to cause either milder or more severe disease. We still don't know if they, will, if they have the ability to evade detection by the viral diagnostic tests that we have and we are using. We still do not know if they have decreased susceptibility to therapeutic agents we have, and we still do not know the full story if they are able to evade um, vaccine-induced immunity. 
So this might seem a lot to you, but this is just to show you the, the characteristics of the four variants that have been reported by the WHO and the CDC, just for you to get a better perspective of, of what we are talking about when we say variants. So the first variant that we encountered actually is the D614G. In this variant, there is a substitution in the gene encoding the spike protein. This variant was first um, reported in China in late January, early February 2020. And by June 2020, it became the dominant form circulating globally. Now, this variant is characterized by increased infectivity and transmission, but it does not cause more severe illness. It does not affect the, the diagnostics. The diagnostics, it does not affect the therapeutics we have. And it also does not evade the, the preventive measures that we have put in place. The second variant is the B117. This is its um, scientific name, but it is commonly referred to as the UK variant. The UK variant is characterized by mutations in both the spike protein and outside the spike protein. And I listed down the mutated um, the mutations here, N501Y and um, and two others, and then outside of the spike protein here. You might be you might notice in a, as we continue that this particular mutation, N501Y, is shared by the other variants as well. And then the UK variant was first reported in Southeast UK late December 2020, although when they did um, genomic sequencing of archived specimens, they found out, they, they concluded that the variant was probably circulating as early as September 2020. And as of today, it has been reported in 62 countries all over the world, including the Philippines. The UK variant has increased transmissibility about 40%. Um, it remains unclear if it has increased virulence and if it does affect vaccine efficacy. But in January last month, there was a report that came out, an article that came out in a scientific um, uh, journal that's, that um, suggested that there is association with increased death. Now, this remains to be elucidated. We are re awaiting more information on this, if indeed it is more virulent or the increase in the number of deaths in the UK is just because of the increase in the total number of cases they are seeing brought about by the UK variant. The third variant is the B1351. You have here the scientific name, and this is the what we call the South African variant. Um, the South African variant is actually a descendant of the UK variant. The UK variant is a descendant of the D614G variant. The, the South African variant, aside from um, N501Y mutation, it is also characterized by E484K variant and another one. And then these are just the variants of the spike protein. They all It also contains variants outside of the spike protein. The South African variant was reported in South Africa late December 2020. And similar to the UK variant, when they did genomic sequencing of archived specimens, they are saying that the variant may have been circulating as early in South Africa as early as October 2020. And as of today, it has been reported in several countries in South Africa, in Europe, in Asia, and then in Australia. Um, I cannot for sure say if we have it in the country already, but I will give you some information what I got from the, from the DOH. Okay? The South African variant has increased transmissibility because of its higher viral, viral load. We still do not know if it has increased virulence. We still do not know for sure if it will affect vaccine efficacy. What we know is that the E484K mutation may affect neutralization by some polyclonal and monoclonal antibodies. So these are treatment modalities that are unfortunately not available in our setting yet, but they are being used in um, other countries. And then the fourth variant is the P1. Uh, the P1 variant is characterized by mutations in the receptor binding domain on the spike protein. And as you can see, the same variant seen in the UK variant as well in the South African variant. And then this was reported in Brazil and in Japan in um, late January 2020. And as of today, it has been reported in Brazil's Amazonas state, 
the Faroe Islands, South Korea, and the USA. For the P1 variant, there are some evidence suggesting that the mutations may affect its transmissibility, but there does not seem to be clear evidence yet on increased uh, virulence. Um, there is concern that its antigenic profile may affect the effectiveness of the vaccine, but once again, this remains to be fully elucidated. So this is just to put in a nutshell the, the considerations and the consequences with regards to the, to the variants. As far as diagnostics is concerned, most molecular assays used to detect the SARS-CoV-2, or what we call the PCR tests, um, use or detect multiple targets. It's usually a combination of two or three targets. And the usual targets are the genomic um, proteins, RF1, RF2, RDRP2. And then it can also detect the N protein, the M protein, the S protein, and the E protein. So in the country, our um, assay, the, the PCR assay we are using is Sunsure. So just for, this is just for your information. The Sunsure detects the ORF1 and the N gene. So basically, um, this will not affect the diagnostic cap capability of our PCR test, uh, the, the, the standard PCR test we are using. The other option we have in the country is the multiplex PCR platform called BioFire. This particular assay detects and amplifies viral RNA. So similarly, um, we do not worry about um, underdiagnosing um, COVID in the country because our existing PCR assays will still be able to diagnose them. And then with regards to the antigen and the antibody flow tests, these are based on the detection of the N protein as well. So even if this is um, utilized in areas where they have no access to PCR tests, there is still no, no worry about um, under-detecting or under-diagnosing um, COVID infections. With regards to the effectiveness of the vaccines against the variants, um, these are preprint articles. We, we will await for the final publication of these articles, but um, Pfizer and BioNTech are saying that their vaccine remains effective against variants with the N501Y mutation. AstraZeneca vaccine remains effective against the B117 or the UK variant. Um, a little concern about the E484 mutation because um, uh, a paper coming out from South Africa is saying that um, variants with this mutation seem to have what we call an immune escape mechanism rendering that might render the vaccines ineffective. But once again, it either ineffective or less effective. But once again, this remains to be fully elucidated. So I hope this will clarify the myth that we have been hearing about um, variants. Uh, one of the common things that I have been hearing is that we cannot keep SARS-CoV-2 variants or future ones from spreading. And this is the reason why we are this, they keep on containing. So they, they keep on happening. So this is a myth because we know that the virus mutates if it replicates. So basically, if the transmission is uncontrolled, replication proceeds as more as the virus continue to replicate, mutations, the, the chances of uh, mutations emerging um, increases. So bottom line, if we stick to the minimum public hundred, um, health standards that we have been following for more than a year now, which are intended to pre prevent transmission, if we prevent transmission, we prevent the virus from replicating. If we prevent the virus from replicating, we will actually prevent mutation from emerging. So I hope that is very a very clear message. Now, the third concern is with regards to the vaccine. And um, most of the important messages will be tackled by Dr. Kat when she discusses the specific vaccines. But the concerns with the vaccines is on safety, efficacy. And because there are a lot of questions about safety and efficacy, we are faced with vaccine hesitancy. And we are even faced with those who refuse to accept that uh, vaccination will be helpful. So what now is the role of the vaccine? So these are facts. Vaccine can, vaccines can eradicate infectious diseases. And a very common example is the smallpox, as well as for most of the countries in the, in the world, uh, they have been able to eradicate polio by, by vaccination program. 
Another fact, vaccines can prevent infectious diseases. So we have a lot of vaccine preventable diseases. There are about 17 of them. Um, COVID-19 will be the 18th vaccine preventable infectious disease. And then vaccines can actually halt an epidemic. And this has been proven in the 2009 um, AH1N1 influenza pandemic, pandemic, wherein they rapidly, they promptly um, distributed the, the, the vaccine and it, indeed it, it stopped the, the epidemic. In 2014 and 2016, a recombinant um, vaccine against Ebola was used to stop the epidemic in Zaire. And then in 2018, a similar Ebola virus was used in what we call a ring immunization in um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And indeed, it successfully stopped the epidemic there. Aside from this, um, vaccines will, vaccines will um, I'm sorry. Okay, my apologies. Aside from that, vaccines are uh, known to produce herd immunity or what we call indirect or population immunity. And this will be discussed in the next slides. So this is just another um, slide to show you that vaccination in combination with the strategies of uh, social distancing and then antiviral treatment can indeed help stop a pandemic. This is a simulation modeling study that was published in 2013. And it just shows you that if you combine the, the standard, uh, the, the social distancing and the other preventive measures together with vaccination, it will, even if, if everybody, if we have achieved herd immunity and then we decide to um, relax uh, the other non-pharmaceutical interventions like social distancing, we will still be able to maintain the, the, the zero cases um, eventually. And then this is persuasive evidence of real world benefit of vaccination, the story of Israel. So in Israel, by middle of um, January, they were able to vaccinate about 90% of their elderly population, more than 60 years old. And they reported that they are seeing a 41% drop in infections. All right, it seems as if we lost um, Dr. Faith. Mm. So yeah, let's give her a couple of seconds while we contact her by phone. And then Siguro we can start Muna with Dr. Roa's lecture. Dr. Kat, are you ready? Dokat. Yeah, hold on. I'll I'll share my All screen. Right. Sige. Jell, if you can call Dr. Faith. Okay na ba, Carl? Yeah, sige ma'am. Okay. We're waiting for um, Dr. Faith. Uh, let's jump into the Mythbusters portion of this lecture. So um, I declare no conflict of interest for this lecture and all mistakes are mine and mine alone. So I would like to acknowledge Dr. Regina Burba of uh, the PGH um, HIKU and also the PSMID Adult Immunization Committee. So just to level off, adverse events are any untoward medical occurrence in a patient or clinical study participant temporarily associated with study intervention, whether or not considered related to the study intervention itself. And serious adverse events are any untoward medical occurrence that results in death, is life-threatening, results in hospitalization or prolongation of existing hospitalization, results in persistent disability or incapacity, 
and or results in a congenital anomaly or, or birth defect. So I'm sure over the past few months, we've heard a lot about vaccine efficacy versus vaccine effectiveness. Mostly right now, people are, um, you know, people from the DOH, FDA, um, WHO are talking about vaccine efficacy. So vaccine efficacy uh, is defined as a reduction in disease due to vaccination. And um, this is uh, a computation that is done on figures that are carried out under controlled conditions. So these are very ideal settings. So even the subjects of the trial are usually homogeneous. And uh, in the scenario benefit, usually you will see the best case uh, and best numbers. So that is why uh, when um, uh, vaccine companies report uh, vaccine efficacy numbers, uh, they're quite high. On the other hand, um, for effectiveness, it's a re re reduction in clinical outcomes due to vaccination, but uh, done in the real world after program implementation. So this is where, uh, if we've read the news, we're seeing uh, a discrepancy in terms of vaccine reported vaccine efficacy based on a trial compared to vaccine effectiveness based on real world scenario. So, because uh, as I will mention later on, we will see um, several factors that will affect uh, vaccine effectiveness. Um, it's estimated from observational studies and usually it's the worst case scenario and usually lower uh, than vaccine efficacy. So what does 90% efficacy mean? It's not as straightforward as it seems. So it depends on outcome as per study definition. So for example, efficacy against confirmed COVID with onset at least seven days after the second dose in participants who had been without evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection, or efficacy in participants with and without evidence of prior infection. It could be efficacy against severe COVID-19 inf infection, efficacy against death due to COVID-19, efficacy against symptom COVID, symptomatic COVID-19 disease occurring after the first dose, efficacy against a symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection, or efficacy against hospitalization due to COVID-19. So it really depends. The, the efficacy depends on what the outcome of the clinical trial example, when we look at the Pfizer study, the efficacy um, it uses based on time period is uh, more than seven days after the second dose. So any COVID case that occurs more than seven days um, after the second dose. For uh, the Moderna trial, they're using uh, more than or equal to 14 days and more than 21 days. So it really depends. Um, that's also why we cannot really um, compare them head to head in terms of just vaccine efficacy because the definitions are different. The outcomes may be different. There, there could be nuances in the clinical trials. Uh, even the subjects could be different. So um, for example, if one study will um, be mostly uh, young, healthy individuals and a different trial will be looking at people with comorbids or elderly people, then the efficacy numbers would also differ. So there is that, um, we should be you know, aware of those uh, intricacies when we uh, interpret the eff efficacy rates. So for example, so it's, it's always a comparison between the vaccinated group to the unvaccinated group. So for example, there was a 90% reduction in cases of disease in the vaccinated group compared to the unvaccinated group. Or under the same conditions as the study, the vaccine reduces the risk of infection by 90% compared to the unvaccinated group. Or for example, of the 94 confirmed COVID cases in the trial, the vaccine prevented COVID symptoms in 90% of those who received the vaccine compared to the placebo or unvaccinated group. So um, again, uh, it's not as straightforward as it seems. So we, let's go to the first myth. The COVID-19 vaccine is not for everyone. So this is a fact. 
Um, the only current uh, contraindication to COVID-19 vaccination is an allergy to a previous dose of COVID-19 vaccine and any of its components. So patients who have experienced an immediate allergic reaction, whether mild, like vicious, or severe, like anaphylaxis, to COVID-19 vaccine after the first dose should not receive the second dose. And patients who have a history of allergic reaction or anaphylaxis to certain vaccine excipients, such as polyethylene glycol found in colonoscopy preparation or laxatives, or found in vascular graft material, surgical gels, and pegylated um, medication should not receive the COVID-19 vaccine. So these are the contraindications for uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Next, next myth. I have allergies to other vaccines and injectable medications. So therefore, I cannot get the vaccine. So this is false. You need to be further evaluated by an allergist. So patients who have experienced an immediate allergic reaction, such as urticaria or pangangate, angioedema, where your eyes swell, uh, your lips swell, difficulty of breathing, and that feels like your, your um, airway is closing up. Um, regardless of severity, to any other vaccine, meaning non-COVID vaccines, or injected therapy must be evaluated by an, by an allergist to assess possible allergic reactions to PEG or polysorbate. So all vaccinated patients with the above history should be observed at the facility after vaccination for a recommended period. So right now, our um, uh, guidelines say that the um, observation period post-immunization is at 30 minutes. Next myth, I have allergies to food and or medications. Therefore, I cannot get the COVID-19 vaccine. So this is false. Um, these are the special groups who can re uh, receive the COVID vaccine. So patients with allergic reactions of any severity to food, inhalant, environmental allergens, insects, latex, oral medications not related to vaccines and their components can receive COVID-19 vaccines. Um, patients with immunodeficiency and autoimmune diseases, including um, GBS and Bell's palsy, may also get vaccinated, but they should be informed there's still not enough data available to establish vaccine safety and efficacy in these conditions. Patients with well-controlled asthma with or without inhaled corticosteroids and those with allergic rhinitis with or without intr intranasal corticosteroids can receive the COVID-19 vaccine. So um, even those who have um, allergies to eggs can receive um, the vaccines, the COVID vaccines. Next myth, I'm pregnant, therefore I cannot get the COVID-19 vaccine. So uh, this issue needs to be discussed your doctor. There's very limited data on the effect of vaccine on pregnant women and their babies, although we need to understand that the COVID-19 vaccines are not live vaccines. Right now, there's only, I think, one uh, live attenuated COVID-19 vaccine undergoing its phase one trial. So it's still, uh, it still has a long way to go. Um, in the small group of women included in trials and in animal studies, uh, no safety concerns uh, were um, flagged for uh, COVID-19 vaccines. So, so in the vaccination of pregnant and lactating women or women who are breastfeeding, um, if these women belong to high priority groups or high risk groups, for example, healthcare workers, these are the things that they should consider. So first is the level of COVID-19 community transmission, uh, whether it's high or low. Second is the patient's personal risk of contracting COVID-19, whether it's high or low. The risks of COVID-19 to the patient and potential risks to the fetus. So for example, if the patient has other, um, the pregnant woman has other comorbidities, um, efficacy of the vaccine, side effects of the vaccine, and of course, she has to understand that there's a lack of the vaccine during pregnancy. And uh, so these are the things that should be discussed between the pregnant or the breastfeeding woman and the, um, her doctor. Uh, for lactating people, uh, they may choose to be vaccinated if they do belong to the um, priority groups. Next myth, if I get vaccinated, 
I can give COVID to my baby through breastfeeding. So there's limited data uh, on this, but the vaccine is not a live virus. So it's unlikely to pose a risk to the breastfeeding child. A lactating woman who is part of a group recommended for vaccination, again, such as health workers, should be offered vaccination. WHO does not recommend discontinuing breastfeeding if the mother is vaccinated. And vaccine efficacy for um, lactating women is expected to be similar uh, as in other adults. So the answer to this is false. But again, uh, discuss the benefits versus the risks with your doctor. Next, I am an immunocompromised. Uh, I am immunocompromised because I suffer from XYZ disease. Therefore, I cannot get the COVID-19 vaccine. So COVID-19 vaccines are not contraindicated for the, these patients unless you have allergies to the vaccine or its components. Again, we go back to our very first and only contraindication slide, right? However, discuss with your attending physician for the optimal timing of your COVID vaccination, depending on your current medical situation. So what are examples of XYZ disease? So autoimmune disease, HIV, cancer, post-transplant, and patients on steroid therapy. So these patients uh, should um, get clearance from their attending physicians before they schedule um, their COVID vaccines. And of course, we need to realize that, you know, these immunocompromised individuals um, need the vaccine because they're at a higher risk of developing complications if um, they get COVID-19. So I have comorbidities, but not yet a senior citizen. Therefore, I will not benefit from the COVID-19 vaccine. Of course, we hear uh, nowadays that you know, after the, the healthcare workers, it's going to be the um, senior citizens who will be um, prioritized. So how about uh, an individual who is not a senior citizen yet, but has comorbidities? Um, so this is false. This, these individuals um, can still benefit from the COVID vaccine. They just need to wait their priority group turn to come up and then they can uh, have themselves enlisted. So adults of any age with the following underlying medical conditions have been shown to be at increased risk for a severe illness from the virus that caused COVID-19. What does severe illness from COVID mean? Uh, hospitalization, admission to the ICU, intubation, or mechanical ventilation, or death. So who are these uh, patients of any age uh, with these um, medical conditions. So cancer, chronic kidney disease, so that means patients on dialysis, uh, COPD, Down syndrome, heart conditions, uh, immunocompromised states from solid organ transplant, obesity, sickle cell disease, smoking, and type 2 diabetes. So they are among the persons to whom the COVID-19 vaccination is recommended and prioritized. Of course, the prioritization from country to country uh, will differ, uh, but the general idea is that these people uh, definitely will need to be prioritized as well. And uh, I currently have active COVID-19 infection. I should get the COVID-19 va uh, COVID vaccine now? So the answer is no, not right away. People who currently have COVID-19 should wait, wait until they have recovered and have completed the isolation um, period. Antibody therapy, such as monoclonal antibodies or plasma convalescent therapy, uh, convalescent plasma, as part of a trial for their treatment, they should wait an additional three months before getting the vaccine. Another myth, I can't spread COVID-19 to others once I've been vaccinated. So unfortunately, we still need more information whether the vaccines protect against asymptomatic transmission. But until herd immunity is reached, wearing of masks, and this is uh, an addition from myself, including face shields, hand washing, and social distancing are the best ways to keep everybody else safe. If I got a recent non-COVID vaccine, I can get a COVID shot as scheduled. The answer is you need to wait for at least 14 days. 
So with regards to co-administration with other vaccines, there should be a minimum interval of 14 days between administration of the COVID vaccine and any other vaccine against other conditions. This is regardless of the order in which they are received. So which means that if you know you're supposed to be getting the um, COVID vaccine, then you will need to delay um, if possible, the other um, vaccines or do not schedule your vaccines uh, within a 14 day period. Um, and this should be followed until data on co-administration with other vaccines become so that there are other vaccines uh, where um, which could be life-saving. So these are uh, tetanus vaccine, tyrabis vaccine. So these vaccines, um, you can uh, get them uh, if necessary, even if it's within the 14-day uh, period um, with the COVID um, vaccine. Next, it's okay to mix and match vaccines and use different brands. So maybe some of us are thinking, okay, if the first uh, vaccine that will come, I'm, I will get the first um, shot of, let's say, brand X, and then if brand Y becomes available after uh, three weeks or so, then I'll get a second shot as brand Y. So no vaccine brands are not interchangeable at this time. There's no data. WHO recommends that the same product should be used for both doses. Uh, US CDC is very specific with regards COVID-19 vaccines, because these are uh, the only two vaccines that have received EUA in the US. So um, the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines are not interchangeable with each other or with other COVID-19 vaccine products. And efficacy of a mixed product series have not been evaluated. COVID vaccines are not halal. So this is false. Uh, according to a representative from the National Commission on Muslim Filipinos, any substance that will effectively and safely protect people is considered halal, especially if it is the only viable option at present. Uh, Muslim leaders in the UK have issued a favorable fatwa uh, using the AstraZeneca vaccine. Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and Moderna have stated that their vaccines do not use gelatin or pork products, although uh, they have not yet been... Uh, uh, inspected by the proper um, authorities. Uh, Indonesia, though, has certified uh, China-made Sinovac's CoronaVac as halal. Um, they really went to the factories in, um, in China and inspected the factories to make sure that the product is halal. I already had COVID-19, so I won't benefit from the vaccine. The thing is, it is not known how long natural immunity to COVID-19 lasts. Um, early evidence suggests that it's not very long, maybe um, only three to six months. And that's why sometimes, you know, we hear about people who, again, would get uh, COVID-19 several months after their initial um, COVID-19 infection. And experts are hoping that vaccination will offer a more durable immunity. Since COVID-19 survival rate is so high, I don't need the vaccine. So it's true that most people who get COVID are able to recover, but it's also true that some people develop severe complications. So far, more than 1.7 million people around the world have died. And as we've seen from um, Dr. Faith's um, slides earlier, over 12,000 Filipinos have already um, died from COVID. It may also cause long-term health problems. So I'm not sure if you've heard of some patients uh, whose lungs were so badly damaged that they had to go home uh, on oxygen support, uh, even at home. And the thing is, we don't know um, how long it would take for, or, you know, for their lungs to recover or if their lungs would still recover in the future. Um, getting vaccinated protects you and the people around you, including those who are most at risk and those who cannot be vaccinated. So, you know, there will be some uh, individuals who, uh, you know, will fall under the contraindicated um, category for COVID-19 vaccines. And definitely uh, these people will need our help. We, you know, to be protected from COVID-19 because they themselves are not uh uh, will not be able to uh, receive the vaccine. So COVID-19 vaccines have really bad side 
we're going to uh, delve into this some more because this is really the concern of a lot of people. So the answer here is that you may experience side effects, but they are not necessarily bad. So side effects from COVID-19 vaccines are caused as part of the immune response to the vaccine. And in some ways, the more vigorous the immune response is, the more common the side effects are. Side effects occurred uh, mostly during the first week after vaccination, usually uh, one or two days after the receipt of the vaccine. And side effects were more frequent after the second dose and more likely to be experienced by younger compared to the older. It could be because, you know, the younger uh, individuals have more uh, vigorous immune responses. Here's another myth. If I didn't experience side effects from the vaccine, it means it didn't work. So this is false. So many people will get the vaccine and not experience side effects. This does not the vaccine did not work for them. In the clinical trial, side effects occurred at varying rates. So there's a wide range. Only about 1 to 20 of every 100 people had example. But efficacy, uh, vaccine efficacy was seen in more than 90 of every 100 people. So, uh, you know, it doesn't always follow, right? So this is very interesting information. It came out, I think, four days ago. Um, what has world safety experience for COVID-19 vaccine so far? So we're privileged, actually, that, you know, now we're seeing the safety data from other countries. And the U.S. has really been uh, sharing their safety data um, in, for the past month. So from December 14 to January 13, uh, they have administered uh, over 13 million vaccine doses and uh, close to 7,000 reports of their vaccinations. Uh, close to 91% were non-serious and 640 were serious. Most frequent of these were head fatigue and dizziness. Um, they had 62 reports of anaphylaxis confirmed, 46 of these after receipt of um, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, and 16 of these after receipt of Moderna vaccine. So what about anaphylaxis? So anaphylaxis is a life-threatening allergic reaction, right? So um, they found this to be at 4.5 cases per million doses administered. So to compare, just um, you know, give us an idea. For inactivated influenza vaccine, the anaphylaxis rate is 1.4 per million. For pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine, uh, it's 2.5 per million. And for live attenuated herpes zoster vaccine, it's 9.6 per million. So they're saying, uh, the US CDC is saying that, you know, uh, anaphylaxis rates for vaccines. Um, okay. let's Last few slides. Okay, so let's look at the um, Pfizer data a little bit closer. So they had 21 cases of anaphylaxis, 11.1 uh, cases per million doses. Most of these occurred within 15 minutes of um, vaccination. Uh, seven of these patients had history of anaphylaxis and four of them required hospital admission. And again, the observation period post-vaccination um, is at 30 minutes um, for us here in the country. How about for the Moderna vaccine? For the Moderna vaccine, um, if you look at the number here, it's 2.5. So they administered uh, a little over 4 million within this period. And uh, they had 10 cases of anaphylaxis. So it's 2.5 cases per million doses. So if you look at it, um, um, if you're really concerned, so for example, if you're a person who, who has a lot of allergic reactions, then might... Uh, consider Moderna as a little bit more favorable for you in terms of the anaphylaxis profile. Uh, of the 10 patients had uh, allergies to drugs like penicillin, ibuprofen, uh, azithromycin, acetaminophen, sulfa, morphine, codeine, and phenytoin, two to contrast media, one to food. Uh, the median from the time of administration to the anaphylactic reaction was 7.5 minutes uh, with a range of one to four. How about deaths? 
everybody's concerned about deaths. So uh, again, this is the, uh, we're referring to the one month data in the US. So they had, again, a little over uh, 13 million vaccinated cases, 113 reports of death after COVID-19 vaccinations and two thirds of these um, that occurred uh, among long-term um, care facility residents. So, um, the thing here is that uh, the background mortality rate for um, all-cause mortality in long-term care facility uh, is really high. So based on their data, among the 1 million uh, residents who were vaccinated, approximately 7,000 coincidental temporally associated deaths from all causes would be expected in the same analytic period. However, so they were expecting 7,000, uh, but they only got 78 reports of death after COVID vaccinations in these and one half of these 78 were hospice or patients with do not resuscitate orders. So they concluded that causes of death consistent, were consistent with background all-cause mortality and did not indicate any unexpected pattern that might suggest a causal relationship with vaccination. So again, we will be taking uh, some preparatory steps, right? There will be uh, the, the vaccination centers will be prepared to handle, to recognize and manage allergic reactions, immediate allergic reactions. Post vaccin vaccinations, the people will be there uh, for 30 minutes to be observed for any reactions um, for treatment. Uh, however, what happens if you already went home and you develop some symptoms? So just remember that you are experience a side effect post vaccination. So you prepared, you need to anticipate it uh, for a light day during your vaccination days or even um, the next day after your vaccination. Common side effects on the arm where you had the shot would be pain and swelling. Uh, common side effects throughout the rest of the body would be fever, chills, headache, and fatigue. And usually it's worse after the second dose of the vaccine. Uh, reactogenic reactions are often mild and subside within a few days with supportive care. So for example, uh, to reduce pain and discomfort, um, you can apply a cool um, wet washcloth over the area and move your arm. Uh, to reduce discomfort from fever, you can take paracetamol and drink plenty of fluids. When do you contact your doctor or vaccine provider? So if the redness or tenderness where you got the shot increases after 24 hours, or if your side effects are worrying you or do a few days, then you need to call your attending physician or your vaccinator, vaccine provider. However, if you develop cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, runny nose, loss of taste or smell, these are not side effects of the vaccines, and you could be having a uh, COVID-19 infection, not from the vaccine though, right? Because it, the thing is, we need to realize that it takes time after we get the, the vaccine before we actually develop um, the, the antibodies. So definitely during that period, uh, we can still uh, get COVID infection. So this is just a summary slide of, you know, uh, which individuals cannot get the vaccine, uh, who needs uh, consultation and clearance from their healthcare provider, and also uh, who should follow uh, special procedures. Now that we have COVID-19 vaccines, the pandemic will be over very soon. Unfortunately, this is false. It will take time to reach herd immunity. Limitations in vaccine production and distribution will have to be considered. And these are the factors affecting vaccine effectiveness. So host factors, age, comorbidity, prior exposure, time since vaccination, vaccine characteristics, mode of delivery, vaccine type, vaccine composition, does it, does it contain an adjuvant? Uh, does it match the circulating strains? I'm sure we've heard about, you know, some of the vaccines having uh, uh, lower efficacy uh, against the newer variants, especially the South African variant. So therefore, the time where, you know, we can already reach herd immunity, uh, then we need to practice the Swiss cheese uh, respiratory virus pandemic defense. And the theory here is that you need to apply each and every layer of protection because should these align, should the 
holes align, then the virus can pass through and infect you. There, but if you do, or if you practice several uh, um, interventions, then you're less likely to get infected. So maayong buntag sa atong tanan, halong kamong tanan, and um, thank you for the kind attention. Over to you, Carl. All right. Um, so we've run out of time, actually. Um, kasi mag na. We've been given a couple of minutes for Q&A. Sabi ni Dr. Faith that we will just uh, answer some questions, which I think is uh, more important at this time. Uh, tama ba, Ma'am Faith? Yes, I can continue with the... Yeah, just so we can address some of the questions, no? Um, uh, well, let me let me just quickly go through the uh, Q&A chat box. And then I would like to ask Dr. Faith or Dr. Kat to address the questions. No? Um, the first one is, um, so Dr. or Ms. Alera uh, said, no? Uh, and this is probably one of the burning questions in everyone's mind. Dr. Domingo of the FDA mentioned that uh, efficacy of Sinovac is so-and-so, no? And they issued an EUA, but they did not recommend it for front medical frontliners. We've been asked to elaborate further. Can you comment on this, uh, Dr. Villanueva? Okay. Actually, I don't have a very... Um... This is just my, based on what I have heard on the news, um, the thing is we do not have the full documents that the, the company submitted to the Philippine FDA for their application of an EUA. So we are actually just receiving the information from the FDA that based on their evaluation, they did grant the EUA, but with the um, recommendation not to give it to healthcare workers. And I think this was based on the, on the results from the study conducted in Brazil, uh, wherein the vaccine, the Sinovac, was given um, to healthcare workers, and uh, the vaccine efficacy was um, determined to be around 50.4%. But um, I think the best person to answer that would be the, the, our, our vaccine expert panels and uh, our FDA. Yeah. So just to be clear, you know, there are several uh, expert groups, actually, no, um, the FDA decision was based on the FDA's expert panel. There is another um, DOSD <laughs> vaccine expert panel, see Dr. Gloriani yung head, and then we have the HTAC. No? So as far as we know, uh, it's only the FDA and its expert panel that has uh, made the decision. And like Dr. Villanueva said, we don't have access to the full data. Usually, if you, you know, PISMID has a um, primer, na merong kaming slide deck, and as soon as the phase three trials are released, no, we, we, we evaluate them, include them. But I don't, I don't know if we can do that with Sinovac because we don't have the data. Huh? All right. Um, yeah, so we don't have the phase three uh, trial data for Sinovac. Yeah, we don't have access to it. But I'm sure it's there because the FDA based their decision on it. Eh, no? So maybe we'll, we'll hear more from them in the next couple of days. Um, I think this is an important question to ask maybe for Dr. Kat and Dr. Faith. No? Could you suggest references, since this is PCP Rinaman, could you suggest references regarding COVID vaccine where we can base our discussions for, uh, for when we discuss with pregnant and lactating patients? Um, pretty much. Most of the trials actually have not uh, enrolled pregnant women or lactating women. I think in the future, they will be enrolling uh, these types of subjects. However, uh, for now, um, WHO and CDC both have um, guidance uh, on the use of COVID-19 vaccines for uh, lactating and uh, pregnant women. So those two um, sites will be helpful. Okay. Um, now, the next question, we, we get this question a lot. Huh? Um, there's a lot of vaccines uh, coming out from different countries. Is there a most effective vaccine uh, for COVID-19? No? And bakit the white and now it's still not available? But I guess the important question there is, is there one most, you know, one most effective? 
Uh, doc. Uh, oh yeah. Okay, siguro, Carl, I'll just I'll just share the the algorithm that I went through. Uh, uh, you know that I used. Uh, in my personal decision-making process. So remember, I had some bullets uh, that, you know, pregnant women had to be, uh, had to consider for their own decision-making. I'm not pregnant, right? But those uh, those points uh, would be applicable to everyone. So the first one is, uh, how high is community transmission in your area? Is it high or low? So here in Davao, it's high, right? Next, uh, what is my risk? in terms of uh, exposure. So for me, it's high. Being ID doctors, it's high, right? So we work in hospitals, we see, um, you know, um, COVID suspects and, you know, patients with pneumonia. Uh, so high, high. The third one is, are you at high risk for complications uh, should you get COVID-19? So my answer is yes. I'm, I'm probably gonna die if I get, uh, you know, COVID. Uh, next is uh, vaccine efficacy. Pretty much, you know, they're almost the same anyway. And even WHO says, you know, as long as vaccine efficacy is more than 50%, that's good enough to be used, right? And then, so now uh, I go to the last point, which is, um, is there a time element? Do I feel the need that, you know, to get the vaccine as soon as I can? And because of the aforementioned factors, um, my answer is yes. Therefore, for me, whatever vaccine that, you know, can get injected into my arm soonest, that's the one that I'm going to get, right? Of course, you also need to consider if you have any other um, conditions that would, uh, you know, make you contraindicated for other for specific types of vaccines. So, yeah. Over to you. Dr. Thank you, Did you want to add anything, Ma'am Faith? Um, I think um, we, that remains to be seen, Paren, because um, I think that question is um, more towards um, are the newer technology or platform vaccines better than the traditional? Because uh, we've always been, because this is now one of the debating uh, points. Some would say, uh, I, I go for those that are traditional vaccines, but because they have been proven for several years that they work. Um, I'm very anxious about the newer technology, the RNA vaccines, because we don't have much information yet. I think those are the background um, thoughts, probably why that question was brought about. But bottom line is, um, this is an ongoing, the studies are still ongoing. We are seeing preliminary data that this is the vaccine efficacy, but uh, bottom line, we still need to wait for the full for the completion of the trials, and then we determine which is if there is really a best or just a better vaccine um, that remains to be seen. Yeah. Now, uh, Dr. Roa, you mentioned in your talk about uh, people who are actively infected with COVID, they need to wait. No? Uh, there's a question here, uh, and Dr. Uh, Ka Caroline Bartolome is asking, what if the vaccine is unaware and asymptomatic, then got his shot? Tapos siguro nagdevelop ng symptoms after, no? What could happen and uh, what to do? Yeah, so the WHO guideline on this really is that um, for patients with symptoms, they're discouraged from going to the vaccine center because they they might uh, infect other people in the in the vaccine center. However, um, they're also not encouraging um, diagnostic testing specifically just to uh, as a decision you know, making tool on whether you can get the vaccine on that day or not. Um, um, so for asymptomatic individuals, if they don't really know, if they don't have any um, significant uh, COVID exposures um, and they don't have symptoms, they just need to follow um, the minimum public health standard, standards um, when they go to the vaccine center. Mm -hmm. So they can still uh, um, get vaccinated. Yeah. And then, yeah, Siguro, well. yes, ma'am. Go okay, ahead. just for everybody's information, part of the vaccination process is a health assessment. So meaning you sign the informed consent and there is a ch screening checklist or health assessment. So all of those will be taken up if you have any of the symptoms. If it is a yes, actually you will be advised not to get the vaccine until that symptom resolves. So um, indeed there are um, what we call precautions that we take before we administer the vaccine, before we will be administering the vaccine. 
Now, um, I don't know if uh, we were very clear on this. There's a question on how young or old is it uh, is the advisable age to get COVID-19 vaccine. I know that there's a lower limit lang, di ba? Um, yeah, so the lower comment. limit for the Pfizer vaccine is uh, 16. Okay. For the Moderna vaccine, it's 18. Okay. Um, yeah, other, other vaccines have enrolled um, younger um, age groups in their clinical trials, but they, uh, you know, we're still waiting for results from those uh, specific uh, age groups. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask Siguro Dr. Villanueva to, to, this was not covered in the question, in the lecture, but may, can you comment or can you explain a uh, long COVID condition? Uh, this is a question from TV5. Uh, or those experiencing lingering COVID symptoms or uh, months after recovery. Or maybe both of you can comment if, if you uh, are familiar with this condition. Or maybe all three of us, if we've had patients. <laughs> yes. Okay, um, um, I, when I, I've had a few patients who followed up at the clinic. Uh, they have there have been months after have, they have recovered, basically, but they still report uh, shortness of breath. They still uh, report myalgia. But then when I do the um, diagnostics to find out if there are still um, active infections or conditions that I need to treat, there seems to be nothing wrong with the with the laboratory diagnostic. So these are basically um, what we call residual effects of the of the inflammatory process that happened during the infection. And then in my experience, I don't know about you two guys, um, I, I, the few patients that I've had who complained of symptoms long after, months after the infection, are actually in the above 60 years old. I've not encountered it in the younger age group. So I think this also is a, a factor. It, there is also the factor of the the age and then the underlying conditions before he suffered, they suffered the, the COVID infection. Mm. Yeah. Do you have any additional input, Dr. Kat? Hi, mute po. In some patients who, you know, who are about to be discharged and yet are still on oxygen, uh, you know, we cannot get them off oxygen um, supplement and they're still having um, shortness of breath, but, you know, they've, uh, already completed their antiviral and all the other and steroids and all that. Uh, so in some of these patients, we do a repeat um, HRCT before discharge and their lungs are still pretty bad. Yes. So, I mean, I don't know uh, how long before the lungs will, you know, look normal again. Uh, but uh, at this point, since, you know, it's the disease is still quite new, we don't really know how long the, you know, the com how long it would take for complete recovery of, of the lungs. Yeah, actually I had the patient to go to mid 2020. She was a doctor from uh, Central Luzon. Uh, so she did teleconsult and she uh, got COVID, had recovered from the respiratory symptoms. She was having fever. For like two weeks now I worked up for autoimmune, wala negative lahat, no? But and then suddenly she just recovered. I guess the point here is long COVID is still something that we need to find out more about. We do not know exactly the mechanism of why people remain symptomatic or people remain sick. But I do know that uh, in some of the other viral infections, it has been described, including SARS-CoV-1, for example, uh, sometimes with flu then. No? Uh, so we don't know what, why this happens. Um, uh, we're also looking forward to learning more about it. Um, oh, um, Dr. Villanueva, the, there's a question about what the vaccines that were used in Israel. Pfizer. They used Pfizer. Pfizer, mostly, no? Mostly yes. Pfizer. Yes. Uh, yeah. So we have a couple more minutes before we need to end our talk. Um, the I know that you mentioned this, Dr. Faith, about uh, resistance, no? Yung, uh, I guess the, the question is referring to the variants. No? Will this affect the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccine in the body? Okay. If I, variants yung nakuha nila. Okay. I think I mentioned this, that um, there are preprint articles with regards to the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, and it is saying that um, their vaccine remains effective. There are preprint articles about AstraZeneca with regards to the UK variant, and the, the company is saying that it remains effective. But the same thing, we really need to await 
um, more data or more information on this. Uh, the South African government actually um, acted already by discontinuing the use of the Astra vaccine because they feel that based on their initial um, studies actually, um, they are saying that the, the Astra vaccine might not be as effective with the E484K mutation and then they are shifting to another um, vaccine. But um, I think that is not a, a, a final decision yet because I think we still need more information on this uh, so we see more uh, people vaccinated. So okay. bottom, line, bottom line, no definite um, answer on the vaccine efficacy. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of researchers are saying that this does not seem to be a major concern, vaccine efficacy, but um, that's it. If indeed there is going to be any, any um, decrease in the efficacy, I believe um, this can be addressed by uh, tweaking the vaccines, adding more for that to be able to cover the, the variants. Okay. Um, all right, so we have just one or two, you know, we have time for one last question. And I want to ask a question that, so there, there's a question about this from TV5, from Eagle Broadcasting, and several other private individuals, no? Do you think the country is ready to switch to modified GCQ? Uh, are we ready to lift, slowly lift restrictions? And I think we'll end on that note. If I may answer first. Yes, sure, ma'am. Actually, I am a little scared of that because here in Cebu, I think you've heard from the news, we are actually experiencing increase in numbers now. Uh, for the past two weeks, our numbers have been more than 200. Our hospitals are full. Our uh, quarantine facilities are, if not full, nearing full. Um, I just feel that I know that lockdown is hard, but I just feel that the minute we try to relax the, the, the lockdowns or the, the quarantines, um, it will somehow translate to people thinking that everything is well. And I fear that they will start um, not minding wearing the mask, not minding wearing the shield, not minding the physical distancing, and then it will actually um, aggravate the problem some more. I know that it is better to really implement the MPHS, the minimum public health standards, but you know that it is very hard. I just, I'm just worried that when that is declared that we go to MGCQ, um, they will start feeling that everything is a little better or a little well, and then that's it. They will, they will lose the, the need to follow, to adhere to the guidelines. And actually, I really worry. Personally, I told my family, nobody goes out of the house. Uh, when 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 the numbers went down um, last year, we did I did allow some of them to go out, but uh, with the, with the numbers increasing in Cebu, just this morning over breakfast table, I said everybody stays home, and that's it. Dokat. Yeah, I hope people have realized that, um, especially during this time of the pandemic, it's really a collective, uh, you know. Uh, sink or survive mode. And we're only as good as the weakest link. And the thing is that, you know, should one person fail to self-regulate in terms of the practice of MPHS, the minimum public health standards, then, you know, we're all, we're you know, we're, we're all in trouble. And uh, based on previous experience, uh, I know that, you know, we're not very good at self-regulation. So is that going to change once we move to MGCQ? I, I think, you know, that's a question every Filipino should answer. Yeah. Thank you. I think those are very important points, no? And I want to I wanna put in my two cents worth. No? So um, as in NCR, when we look at the curve, um, the bar that we had a really high peak uh, back in June and July, and Dr. Faith showed this in her slides, no? a really high surge in June, July, and then para nag plateau siya. But the plateau levels weren't did not match the early part of the of the yeah. pandemic. No? It really was still higher. No? And then after the holidays, we had this very mild, very mild peak na umaket ulit. No? And that was because you know people went out, etc. Um, if you, I think, so um, yung, yung 
variant that was circulating in the June, July. That was the D614G. No? And now we know that we have circulating here in our midst yung, yung uh, B117 and the other new variants. No? And one of them, the South Africa variant, has not been shown to be here, but sabi nga ni Dr. Faith, um, it's possible, it's possible na lower efficacy yung vaccines. No? The vaccines are already here. So parang konti na lang yung titiis natin. <laughs> parang, let's, not, let's not squander it. However, I do, I do really feel that there must be some balance between... Kasi the reason naman bakit gusto mag-MGCQ is uh, to, to sort of get the economy back on track. No? And ako, personally, I think that there is a way to sort of strike a balance. Um, but I don't know if striking that balance ang MGCQ yung answer. I'm not sure. No? Um, and I think that we also need to go by uh, locality. No? So kung sa Cebu, rising, maybe wag muna. No? Kung sa ganito, wala naman talaga silang masyadong cases, maybe they can loosen restrictions a little bit. Again, this yeah. is not the... This is not the the stand or the statement of the societies that we represent here. Now, these are personal um, opinions. No? Yeah. All right, and with Mark, that... I, yes, Charles, um, just, just to add, I, I think people need to realize that uh, livelihood and safety are not two mutually exclusive concepts. Yes. I mean, you can go to work, report to work, you know, just practice your, your you know, just wear a mask, your shield, practice social distancing and all that. I mean, yes. it's possible. You yes. can, um, uh, what, go to the grocery, right? Buy your essentials, and but still practice the, the minimum public health standards. These are not mutually exclusive things. Right. Even in, in, you know, places of work, it can be done. They can, you know, they can just uh, um, stagger the, the shifts of the workers so as to prevent crowding, it's the same thing with transportation. They can stagger, uh, you know, time, uh, what's this, uh, dismissal times uh, from work so that people don't crowd in the, in the public transportation. These, can be, these things can be done. Yeah, so like I, I said, don't really buy the whole... There's a way the whole, talaga to, you know, to, fit, to yeah, work there is a way. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not a mutually exclusive thing. Yeah. Okay, so we've run out of time as usual. It's a very interesting discussion. Uh, lots to talk about. Unfortunately, we just have to end our, our talk. And damning questions that I was not able to address. No, but uh, I'd like to thank everyone who came. There, there's now about 300 people in uh, the Zoom room, and in Facebook, I think there are about 400 or 500 viewers. The recording will be made available and in the PCP and the PSMID Facebook pages, so you can view it again if. Uh, you want to go back to some of the questions, no? Um, the take-home message, I think, here is the vaccines, while there are side effects, it is safe. The safety data shows that, you know, um, it's very acceptable. Uh, allergy, the anaphylaxis is not such a big issue. And if given the choice, uh, especially for our, our, co our colleagues in the medical industry, no? We would like you to get vaccinated if it's your turn. No? That's the main point of, of this whole um, session. So thank you very much for attending this morning. And uh, we hope to see you in another uh, webinar of either the PCP or the PSMID. Have a good morning, Paul. Thank you. Bye.